Today on Timescast Media Tech, after the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut, we look at the consequences of mistaken identities in breaking news events and the blessings and curses of media coverage. Welcome to Timescast Media Tech. I'm David Gillen, reporting for the New York Times. If this is your first time watching the show, what's coming is not our usual format. Today's entire show will be focused on the media's coverage of the school shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. As details from the tragic shooting at Sandy Hook continue to emerge, the media has come under some fire for reporting information that turned out to be wrong. At times, speed seemed to win out over accuracy. I'm joined now by Buzz Machine's Jeff Jarvis and Nita Soltani, the author of My Stolen Face, the story of a dramatic mistake. Welcome. Thank you. Jeff, let me start with you. Uh, we are feeling our way uh, through a, a new world of social media in which we watch reporting unfold in real time and some of the old rules just don't seem to apply anymore. In the hours after uh, what happened in Newtown, we saw uh, various news outlets, social media, reporting sometimes breathlessly information that was wrong. The gunman's name, the mother's occupation, uh, how he got into the elementary school, Sandy Hook. Uh, is there any way that we can hold media accountable for these kinds of errors? And is it possible? Should we even try? This has been an issue since 24-hour news, right. when the fog of war comes to the fog yeah. of all breaking stories. And no, that's not an excuse, but what it, uh, I think, has taught the public is to act as an editor at every turn. And we can point to many stories where this is true before yeah. Twitter and before Facebook. Uh, and I was part of the problem. Uh, I uh, uh, watched CNN and MSNBC, saw the name alleged to be the, the shooter in Newtown, uh, found a Twitter account through Twitter yeah. of yeah. Uh, under that name, read it, and, and, and I then made the mistake of treating Twitter like a living room conversation rather than like a medium. And as if talking to friends, I said, oh my God, this is yeah. such eerie stuff to read. I should have put in there the things I learned as a journalist. We teach as a journalist yes. to have couched it, to have said allegedly or reputedly, to have said that if this is the case, yeah. um, to have shown my sources. And so I say that social media is not really media, it's just people having a conversation, but it brings with it some of the responsibilities of media because it can spread so fast yes. and so far and then become permanent as well. Yes, Nita, you know something about this firsthand. Um, you know about inaccurate information on social media. You had to deal with serious repercussions yourself. Just talk about that a little bit. Well, of course, what happened to me is on a very different level. This tragedy is so profound and so overwhelming. but. As Jeff said, it is exactly what happens, and it seems it is time and over again, when media rushes to identify a person without any research or without any uh, double checking of the data they have. And this data tends to come out of uh, social networks, mm. such as Facebook, such as Twitter. In your, in your case, it was Facebook. It was Facebook. In my case, after the, an amateur video, of the death of Ms. Neraga Sultan was broadcasted. Uh, the media rushed to identify and to give yes. a face to that person. So somebody searched uh, Facebook, came across my name and my profile, took my photo and my name, and without my knowledge, spread it worldwide. Right. And this was similar in some ways, although as you pointed out uh, before we began, you were confused with a hero. Exactly. Uh, and Ryan Lanza, the brother of the shooter, was confused for somebody <laughs> Hardly a hero. Um, so very, very different. What kind of effect does that have on on a person to be mistaken? Like that on a personal level, mm -hmm. of course, it is very traumatic. Yeah. So for the years to come, I don't know, just but I can imagine that yeah. for the years to come, this particular person is going to live with the tragedy and the impact of that mistake, although the mistake was corrected much faster right. than in my case. Right. But as I mentioned earlier, the difference is that I've been identified with some, I've been mistaken with someone that is an icon yeah. and is celebrated everywhere as a hero. And that just is very different. The relationship, right. the connection that I have with this person, and I did not know just Nera Aga Sultan, but in this case, we are talking about a person who has a who has lost a mother, a brother, yes. under very, very tra traumatic and tragic and negative yeah. just circumstances. Yeah. You know, we like to say uh, that journalism's first obligation is to the truth, and its very essence is a discipline of verification. 
But given the immediacy of social networks and the web, is it realistic to think that people will be willing to wait for the fact checking before posting anyway? Or do we simply accept that reporting has evolved in such a way where information comes out first and corrections come out second? If we had waited for official verification yeah. of the murderer's name, it would not have come until yesterday. Yeah. So that would not work in this world. I think that the key skill in this, in this fast moving media landscape we now have, more and more it's the case, the key skill of the journalist is not to say what we know, because everybody knows that. Right. It's to say what we don't know. It's to say what our attribution is and to link back to the provenance of what we know and make that clear. So that what happened in a lot of cases, people said, well, CNN said it, they're journalists, it must have been approved. Right. Right. And so it feeds upon itself. So even that is, is, is a weak system. I mean, part of what you're talking about is, is, is an is a element of transparency. Absolutely. Which, what's vital, it seems vital in this case is, is transparency. Um, but we've talked a lot about it, obviously, in the newsroom here, about, uh, as you can imagine. This is not the first time, nor will it be the last time, that journalists and ordinary people jump to conclusions based on what's flying around on social media. Uh, it happened after this shooting in Aurora. Um, but Facebook and Twitter are, you know, are fundamentally technology companies, but everybody uses them for a platform uh, for news and information. Is it responsible how, for, for mainstream media to rely as heavily as we do on them? Well, what do you think? <coughs> look, at, look at the people. Oh, let let's, let's start Absolutely these. not. Okay. There is no way. I mean, for me, there is no justification in ruining a person's life, a, the sense of the identity that a person has, which can, in a certain case, in my case, bring about serious mm -hmm. endangering situation. My life right. was in danger just because of the mistake of the media and the very fact that nobody was willing to correct the error. Right. So in your mind, in your mind, if, say, the lead blog here at the New York Times, which, which blogs uh, and, and, and uh, uh, from various sources uh, along the way, if they linked to these Twitter posts. I mean, is that a failure on, on our part? And I actually, I'm not sure if we did and how much we did, but in your mind. Well, of course, I look at it from a very personal, personal level yeah. and Jeff looks at it from a professional level. And of course, just I understand that um, the world we are living today somehow requires a much fast-paced reaction, yeah. especially on the side of the media. But on the other hand, I, as I said, I see no justification in that, just to hypothesize who a hero or a villain, let's say, just yeah. um, of a news broadcast is. Right. There is no justification in that, right. because that person's image and that person's sense of identity is affected. Right. I want to take a couple of steps back here, because I I feel at times that it's, it is easy to romanticize reporting in the pre-web, pre-social media era, but you know, errors and sometimes huge ones have been common in moments of crisis. So you talk about the fog of war, absolutely. Uh, we learned after Fort Hood, for example, uh, from an army official uh, that the shooter in that case had been killed. Yeah, he hadn't been. Um, or even supposedly more careful reporting that's not under, that's not live, not under, uh, you know, uh, the, the crush of, of deadline. Um, do you think, Jeff, that, that mainstream media types are simply nostalgic for something that didn't, perhaps didn't really ever exist truly? Well, it did to the extent that when you were in the era of the notebook and the printing press, there yeah. was a long period of time in which we all have lived through stories, I certainly did, where, whew, you know, just before deadline, we yeah. find out the facts and got them better. There's no such thing as a deadline now. It's yeah. a constant, it's constant flow of information. And, and to your earlier point about trying not to rely on these things, well, then we wouldn't have had, let's say, the picture of the plane landing in the Hudson River. Excellent point. Right? Mm -hmm. Excellent so point. The, the truth yeah. now is that witnesses and participants in news can and do share with the world, and that becomes the basis of much news. But it becomes all the more reason where we as journalists have to add value to that. Yeah. We add value by confirming things, by, by debunking things, by especially, I think, adding context and, and the kind of caveats that we need to give. And that's a skill that we have to remind ourselves of and that we in journalism, I should have done this myself, need to present an example of that. It's interesting, I, I, I was saying to somebody here also that, that what 
Twitter may have, uh, inaccurate information may have moved out across Twitter, but the corrections moved out quickly too, perhaps more quickly than could it would have been the case had you had a team of local reporters just trying. So it's, it's sort of crowds, crowdsourcing, crowd editing, self-correcting in time. I, I think so. so. So we have, what we need is a new definition of media literacy right. that uh, says that we yeah. all understand yeah. that the news will change, not can, but will change. And that, and that we have a better sense of when things are in fact confirmed. And until they are confirmed, we give the caveats. Now, I think what, what, what Ned is saying is, is, uh, is different too, that there's context involved. Yeah. The plane land in the Hudson, there's a picture of it, no denying that. It's right. another matter to get the wrong identity and realize the impact on someone's life. You had profound impact on your life. Right. And we have to be more aware of that and thus treat certain things with different levels of, of care and caution. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, it was very interesting. I, I was thinking back to 9-11, uh, and particularly to Peter Jennings' uh, coverage. He was on the air for more than 24 hours straight. It was remarkable to watch. And at one point, he was talking about how the television uh, had become sort of uh, the equivalent of the national campfire, where we gather around, uh, you know, when something bad happens, or even when something good happens, and we, we celebrate or we, or we mourn. Um, and it seems to me that uh, it partly, you know, the, the web is really, has become that in all its, in all its messy, fragmented uh, ways. What do you think of that? Yeah. Well, I would. I m somehow my thoughts wandered off as Jeff was talking. I, I do not like to look at it. I understand this perspective very well, but I do not think that just if the mentality of the media is that for greater good sacrifices should be made, mm -hmm. what you are sacrificing is the life of a person. So many, it's a chain of accidents how I managed to get out of that dangerous situation right. and be sitting with you here. And if a single chain in the link of the accidents right. and coincidences have missed, I don't know where I would be right now. Right. And that is not fair. Last question, just very quickly. You know, some have criticized uh, the, the way the media have descended on, on Newtown. Inevitable, uh, clearly, um, and yet others have said that they've done a pretty good job uh, in, in many ways, despite these these failures. Mm -hmm. Overall, in the totality of this, Jeff, Nita, what do you both make quickly of of how we've done? I had to turn it off this morning because I think that the, the pathos became exploitation today, and this goes back to the impact upon lives. Yeah. And yes, we want to know who the victims are. We want to remember them as people, but then to repeat it over and over and over again to put the dagger in every heart, I, I think goes too far. There is only so much known, only so much to say. There's no need for thousands of people there. Um, do what you do best and link to the rest is what I say about journalists. And, and are we truly adding value or are we exploiting is a question we have to go through. Right. Dita? And for me, it is very important to distinguish between commercial news and such a deep and profound experience that so many people who have lost their loved ones, I mean, looking at the photos of some of those kids was enough for me. Yes. And just my heart goes out to those people who will never have the opportunity of embracing their angels. There must be a difference between the way you treat a a commercial piece of news and such a profound and just heart-wrenching piece of news. Thank you both for coming in today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's our show. Check back, back with us on Wednesday for more of the latest in media and technology. See you then.